design systems and organizations where even when the people within them know what is right, they know like what is needed. And you see this in emergencies, you know, in COVID, the normal rules of what's allowed start to yeah. break down, they become looser and people start to behave in very different ways and be able to respond to things that are happening. And they have the ability and freedom to use all of their capacities of love, imagination, relationships, um, you know, contextual sensitivity to what is needed in that moment, what they can provide, what the constraints are. And suddenly you have a very different way of organizing. But the Hello and welcome to Planet Critical, the podcast for a world in crisis. My name is Rachel Donald. I'm a climate corruption journalist and your host. Every week I interview experts who are battling to save our planet. My guests are scientists, politicians, academics, journalists, and activists. They explain the complexities of the energy, economic, political, and cultural crises we face today, revealing what's really going on and what they think needs to be done. These are the stories of the big picture. Go to planetcritical.com to learn more and subscribe. My guest this week is the wonderful Phoebe Tickell. Phoebe is a renegade scientist, a former genetic biologist, Phoebe set out to understand, why is it that we have the solutions, and yet we don't act on them? After years of experimenting, learning, and collaborating, Phoebe turned to imagination. Phoebe joins me to tell that story, which led her to founding Moral Imaginations, an organization which has created a framework for moral imagining, creating tools and practices that people can use to imagine together, collectively, new solutions to old problems. Moral Imaginations has recently completed phase one of a project with Camden Council, in which 32 officers were invited to use the Moral Imagining framework to explore their roles and the purpose of this borough council within London. Phase one of the project is just completed and she walked us through that. They also have a report that's just come out and links to that are in the show notes. And they're about to embark on phase two. And as Phoebe says at the end of the episode, they are looking for partners. So if Phoebe's message speaks to you today, which I am sure it will, and you'd like to invite moral imaginations into your organization, your institution, your life, then please reach out to them. They are doing astonishing work. I hope you all enjoy the episode. If you do, please share it far and wide. And if you're loving the show, become a patron on Patreon or support Planet Critical with a paid subscription at planetcritical.com. By signing up, you'll get the Planet Critical newsletter inspired by each episode delivered straight to your inbox every week. You'll also have access to the wonderful Planet Critical community who are full of inspiring thoughts, ideas, critiques, and determination. The links are in the description box below. I'm so grateful to everyone who chooses to support the project. I'm a vehement believer in ad-free and open access content, so Planet Critical wouldn't exist without the direct support of the amazing community. Thank you so much to all of you who believe in Planet Critical and keep the project going every week. Phoebe, thank you so much for joining me on Planet Critical. It is such a pleasure to have you on the show. I'm super excited to be here. I feel like we've been um, circling each other for the last month and mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. trying to find a time to chat. So yeah, super excited for this conversation. And not even a month, I mean, specifically for this interview, but your name has been on my radar for ages. And as per the Planet Critical rules, like didn't want to sort of directly contact you, wanted to wait until, you know, the network kind of brought you in because I tend to think that's when my thinking is ready <laughs> when the network suggests someone. Um, so I'm so glad to finally have you. Very cool. I didn't know that was one of the planet critical uh, rules that you wait till mm -hmm. people, do, do you wait till somebody introduces you to someone? So that it's, yeah. You yeah, that's yeah. It's, it's very rare that I'll sort of go off and like cross a boundary um, because just with like the ecosystem of thought and how it all coalesces and expresses itself, I find that if I tend to wait for the network to present someone to me, by that point, by some miracle, I will have actually learned enough to be able to understand what it is that they're saying. <laughs> Whereas if I tried to do it six months before, I wouldn't have really been able to follow. Nice. Good yeah, yeah. logical principle. And there you go. I thought you'd like that. On that, <laughs> you weren't a scientist, Phoebe. How did you go from scientist to imagination activist? Um, well, such a great question. I think I'd start by saying that I think all scientists are imagination activists or at least start mm -hmm. as imagination activists. When I think back to my training as a scientist, I think it's been a massive, massive part of what's led me into doing the work I do now, which is really 
experimental. It's, yeah, as you said, it's really focused on imagination, translating imagination to action. Um, yeah, yeah, developing hypotheses and framework. Like a, a lot of it does quite scientific. Um, but I think in society, we have this idea that imagination and science and are different and separate. You know, the arts and the sciences or imagination and science are different things. Um, but actually, when you think about scientists, like the best scientists are massively imaginative. Like people working in, uh, you know, anything that's microscopic, like my background is molecular biology. So I was spending a lot of time um, with DNA and thinking about, you know, imagining DNA because I was working as a genetic engineer. Um, we can go into that because it, yeah, I, I have quite complex, a complex position around genetic engineering, but um, mm. at the time I was working in genetic engineering of algae and bacteria to make biofuels. So it's like, which, you know, you know, which looking back now, I would ask like, what, what do the algae think about that? What do that, you know, how do the algae mm. bacteria feel about that? Um, but during, you know, during that time, like every day I was n by necessity exercising imagination to imagine the DNA, to imagine what will happen if we cut this bit of DNA, what happens when we put it in the bacteria, how does it interact with, you know, the, the substructure of the bacteria? Like, it's, it was so imaginative. So I feel like the separation of science and imagination is a, to is a totally false um, distinction. Um, but like, I guess talking practically, like how did I go from being in the lab um, at Imperial College to working on imagination? Um, it's, been, it's been a journey. And I, I, don't know, I, I assume this journey is what you want to hear about. Sure, yeah. <laughs> um, and you, we have talked a bit about this before, but um, I guess like in a really, in a boiled down version of the story of what happened between then and now, I started in science and technology and really wanted, you know, I wanted to have a positive impact. Like I think some people go into science because they love science. Some people go into it because it's interesting. Some people go into it because they think it's going to be a really positive way to have impact on the world. Um, for me, it was probably a combination of, of those three. Um, but I, I, I was really interested in like how we can, um, un, un screw up the world basically. Like I was seeing, as I was growing up, I was seeing a lot of issues with the education system. I mean, with inequality, with climate change, uh, I went to my first climate protest. I think I was about 15, um, around the, the like Heathrow airport runway. Um, so I was already think thinking quite a lot about these things. And what I saw was that actually the more time I spent looking at science, look looking at, you know, the, the solutions coming out of science and technology, um, the more I became convinced that actually we already have all the scientific tools, all the technology that we need um, to actually make the world work for everybody tomorrow. If, if we decided, if somebody locked you know, humanity into a room, which, you know, in a sense, I do feel like that's what's happening and said, like, by tomorrow, you have to solve all of this. Um, I don't think it's materially impossible. I don't yeah. think problems are in the material realm and in the resource realm, which is why I've then gone on that journey of moving away from technological material solutions to actually trying to work out what is that action gap between like having the tools and the technologies and not making the choices um, that, that are necessary to design systems that work for all, for all human and for all non-human beings. Um, and so that journey, you know, I was really influenced by people I read after I graduated, like um, Tagore and um, uh, Krishnamurti, like some of these like deeper philosophers, Ivan Illich, you know, really influenced me around his de-schooling society. Um, you know, and, and I've been hugely influenced by Joanna Macy um, and and other others who we can talk about bell hooks as well. Um, you know, who really he really got me thinking about where is the issue, where is the block, why is it that when as a humanity we all agree that we want the same things, but we can't actually get there, we can't actually make those choices. So that journey journey took me to work at Schumacher College. So I worked there for two years. Um, I was part of a team. Um, that worked on the holistic science masters, and it's an amazing place. They they designed these uh, alternative courses around ecology, like ecology at the heart, ecological design, ecological economics, um, complexity science, and systems thinking. 
um, and became really interested in governance. So, you know, when, when I was thinking about like, why are we not making decisions that serve everyone? Um, that, that took me down the path of governance and realizing that there's a whole field of people and academics and projects and, you know, all sorts of people who are really like applying themselves to this issue. How do we make better decisions together? What could decentralized decision making look like or decentralized organizations, distributed governance? Like, you know, I'm really inspired by the work in V Taiwan um, and Audrey Tang, like these amazing examples where people are trying to um, make decisions in different ways that include a lot more people, participatory budgeting, you know, making decisions around finance together, like harnessing the collective. And that was super, super interesting. Um, at the same time, I felt that during that, though, it was about four or five years I was working in, in that field of like horizontal governance, decentralized um, organizations. And I was part of an organization called Inspiral, which is a um, New Zealand based, although global network of uh, social innovators who kind of prototyped like a completely decentralized organization and made tools like Lumio that does collective decision making and um, CoBudget that, that is, is a tool for participatory budgeting. But what I felt was like, even if we managed to, to like design these collective decision making protocols and tools, there's still something missing, which is like the, the ethics, the connection to like what's important, the connection to a sense of like who we want to be and, and not just like what we can do, but what we should do. So there was something really still like really missing for me around um, how can we actually support people and leaders to make decisions and to, to do things from a place of like deep rootedness to what's important and to the potential of, of who we could be, you know, as a species, as a planet, as a global community, ecological community. Um, and so that is really what has led me to moral imagination, which is, you know, what, a kind of imagination or what we've been uh, referring to um, the work we do. It's also a term that's been around for like since the late 1700s. Um, and what it, what's interesting to me about moral imagination is it's the combination of what is possible, but also what should, ha what should happen. So it's not just what's possible and exploring possibility and unlimitedness and, you know, the, the kind of potentiality. It's combining that with a deep, rooted sense of what is right and what is wrong um, and how do we actually stand up, you know, on behalf of life um, and protect life and protect what is important and, and actually serve, you know, the interests of all people and all non-human people as well. Mm. That is fascinating. So, I mean, suppose the thing that stands out would be What's happening in the world today is an imagination of, of what is possible. I mean, scientifically, the amount that's being thrown into sort of progress, whatever that may be in the, the STEM field is, is astonishing and not to be laughed at, but there is a lack of imagination around what, what should happen. What is, what is right for humanity? What is right for the species with whom we share this planet? What is right for our biosphere? Yeah. How do you get people into a space where they begin to imagine like that or think like that? And also, is it not too far a leap for most? Mm. So how do we get people to imagine? To ha I mean, what I, what, what, the question is, how do we get people to have a space, which I think is a really important part of it, is actually giving people the space and the opportunity and the permission, which is what a lot of the work that moral imaginations is is doing and advocating for, especially in our public institutions and local councils. Um, I think it's really, really important that people can, um, rather than having things foisted on them, like you should think like this, you should behave like this, this is the right way of doing it, which is a kind of moralistic top-down um, approach. Moral imagination is about giving people the space, the practices, um, the, the kind of confidence, the psychological safety, the, the permission to exercise their own bottom-up morality, their own um, moral imagination, which is like, 
coming from what is deeply important to them, who they are, who their ancestors are, what their relationships are, what their culture, you know, wh which cultures they come from, what they've, you know, what, what has led to all of that historical context of who they are, um, their relationships to, to nature and to the more than human world, um, and then connecting them to a sense of future and future generations. Um, and so giving them those conditions of those three things, ancestors, more than human um, perspectives and future generations, that's like the core of how we are creating a space um, for people to exercise imagination in this really connected way, um, which can then allow people to have the space and the, and the kind of, um, yeah, the container to reconnect with a part of themselves, which was never lost. It, it, it's always been there, but it just needs um, a reconnection. So there's this moral essence to, to most people. Um, would you say that despite different cultures or despite different ancestors does tend to boil down to a desire to mm -hmm. be well and to treat one another well? I think there's, I, I think everybody has a sense of what is deeply important to them. I mean, I, I, I don't want to start, um, yeah, kind of making assumptions about all people and you know, starting to to get into a space of pretending that I know how you know the billions of people on this planet operate and and um, you know all of those complex systems of of how they yeah how how they come to decide what's important. But I do think that everybody has their own deep sense of what is important to them, to their family, to their cultures, to their communities, um, and that's the capacity. I think that that I'm really interested in helping people connect to, um, and I think it's not just about the, the people and the individuals in the system. It's also the system. Obviously, it's the system itself. So we've designed systems and organisations where even when the people within them know what is right, they know like what is needed, and you see this in emergencies. You know, in COVID, the normal rules of what's allowed start to mm -hmm. break down. They become looser. And people start to behave in very different ways and be able to respond to things that are happening. And they have the ability and freedom to use all of their capacities of love, imagination, relationships, um, you know, contextual sensitivity to what is needed in that moment, what they can provide, what the constraints are. And suddenly you have a very different way of organizing. But the normal way of operating within organizations and institutions is that there are bureaucratic rules, there's red tape. There's, you know, there are ways of behaving and, and not behaving. There are things that you can say and can't say. You know, there's, there's a real issue with psychological safety, performance culture. You know, the, the kinds of cultures and containers that organizations create are not conducive to people exercising their moral imagination. And, you know, we could, we could just take the moral part off and just say imagination. Because I think, you know, a lot of people, when they use the word imagination, I think it does also have a... Um, it's, it, it suggests something beyond just imagining or, you know, dreaming or, or the future. There is something deeper there, um, even just with imagination without, without the moral um, as part of it. But currently within organizations, people really, I think that that's the work. That's why the work we're doing right now, you know, it feels really interesting and, and we're learning so much because actually how to create spaces within organizations and within institutions for people to, to, to unleash a capacity that's already there. It's not something that needs training. Um, you know, and, and we've, we've ummed and ahed about whether to call our imagination activism training a training because in a sense, it's a, it's a training, you know, it's, it, and that's what fits into the, to the category of, you know, the things that organizations will allow into their system trainings. But at the same time, it's more of a kind of activation or an unleashing or a, it's actually about taking away limitation rather than like training people in a new capability or, or building skills. Um, so that's, yeah, that's, mm -hmm. that's what I think. Before we go and sort of get into the, the weeds of it, the details of it through talking about this uh, wonderful project with Camden Council. I suppose the one word that I want to come back to, moral imagination is a combination of what is possible and what should happen. That should is, is carrying a lot of weight there because 
surely within systems um, that are currently operating, there is a sense of what should happen, but it's not a sort of collect, uh, bottom-up collective imagining. It's a, it's a directive. Mm. What is that should ordinarily and how does that, um, how does that interplay with people's, you called it a capacity for imagining beyond like the, the performance culture? Um, what shoulds are we sort of existing within that deliberately impede our ability to imagine? Mm. Such a great question. I, I am going to answer the question as I'm hearing it, but tell me if I haven't answered the question sure. that you're asking. Um, I think that what's really interesting is that I think within organizations and within, you know, the institutional world, you know, or wherever you want to put the boundaries of this society, there are way too many shoulds that are not the shoulds that are connected to a deep sense of what is right. There mm -hmm. is a, a lot of should around, oh, we should appear this way. We should, um, you know, we should obey this red tape. We should do what the, you know, the system here is. There's, there's the kind of should of, of, um, of sticking to the way things have always been and the way things work around here, but there is too little should um, around taking those brave kind of disruptive steps towards the, the kind of change that we need in this current time. I mean, we basically don't, we don't have a lot of time left. Like I, it's really getting to that point where I think like we've been going, we've been within um, the you know, UK civil society systems change scene. Like I think most people have been talking about the kinds of changes that need to happen for, for like decades, you know, um, and you, you know, more than anyone else, like you're involved in Extinction Rebellion and, um, you know, some of the other climate, you've interviewed a lot of people from the climate space, like the time is really ticking. Mm -hmm. um, and so again, I, I'm, I'm interested in that gap. It's like that action gap that mm -hmm. I saw in science and technology. It's like that gap now is becoming more and more urgent to jump across because we're just we are running out of time so that how to how to like close that gap whether it's building people's moral courage um and moral imagination and their ability to speak out about what's important and make courageous decisions that go against potentially everything they've been trained to do um that's that's what we need to see we we need to we need to like and and community and movements and relationships are so important to that because it's also not a good idea to be courageous. You know, it's not always a good idea to be courageous if you're within a system where you will just be punished for that. So the mm -hmm. more support, the more relational shifts are possible where the collective is able to actually enable things to happen that previously seemed impossible um, and previously, you know, would get people in trouble. That's where systems change happens, where the culture shifts and things become possible and people do things. And yeah, there's, there's kind of the ability for radical change where people don't then become penal, you know, get so penalized that it shuts down, you know, the ability of the system to evolve in that way. Absolutely. I, <laughs> the thing that I'm kind of sticking on, uh, because you're using all of these, uh, wonderful, this wonderful terminology that allows for a different way of looking. So I love action gap as well. And it's like, okay, well, if we have moral imagination and a, a sense of shoot around, you know, imagining and knowing and, and then imagining like what is right, a, se a sense of, of goodness, a sense of what should be done. What is the, where does the should come from that creates the action gap that impedes us from doing what is right? Mm. And if, because if the moral imagination, if, if that's an act of an ad imagination, which is an act of should, and what we are seeing is a system that is refusing to or being held back even from evolving to meet the next step of, you know, human society, which is like, well, how do we feed 8 billion people mm. and also not burn the house down at the same time? Mm. That is fundamentally not an act of imagination then, is it? Yeah. It must be antithetical to imagination. So what is that? Where does that should come from? Is it that, you know, the sort of like perpetuation of systems sort of begins to create a bastardized meta narrative of itself and um, that gets transmitted through people as if you know we are just sort of antenna of something much bigger than ourselves like a really really bad god um or 
or is it I don't know I don't know I suppose yeah. that's what I think it is then yeah <laughs> if I don't yeah. know what else it could be <laughs> no yeah so I could I think this is one of the most important questions um at this time I I think part of the problem that we find ourselves in is the institutionalization of things like care things like charity generosity um and I'm I'm definitely influenced by Ivan Illich in this. Um, and it's a bit of a conundrum because we've created you know, a whole institutional system um, for how kind of care, healthcare, um, you know, services, charity, like all of that is being provided by an institutional meshwork. Um, previous to that, Human beings, for, for better or for worse, you know, for, for good qualities and for, for negative qualities, had to kind of self-organize to meet those needs themselves. And, and you know, and between those things, there are, there are smaller, more local systems. And it's really interesting that in places like the Netherlands, you know, healthcare, there's a, healthcare has been um, decentralized by this uh, very interesting organization, Bertzog organizes in um, kind of self-organizing small circles of 10 to 12 nurses. So rather than have the big institutional systems that deliver nursing where nurses get like eight minutes per patient and it's all top organized in a very top-down way and nurses were burning out and reporting that they don't actually get that relational time with their patients. They're, you know, they're, they're just having to basically operate like a machine. We've created a machine, a mechanized system of care and of, of um, human warmth and relationality. Um, and, you know, meanwhile, become more and more atomized. You know, community housing is, is more and more rare. Um, you know, the nuclear family, like there's been a complete atomization. Yeah. Um, we've moved out of local communities. We've moved into mega cities, and that's only increasing. And then we've got the institutionalization of care. Um, and what I think that strips of us is that that um, ability, that capacity that comes out during emergencies where the institutions can't keep up with the pace of the emergency that's happening and therefore that actually falls away and you start getting this very interesting like complex system organizing. Um, if we were to refer to like Dave Snowden's work and uh, of Kinefin, you know, the kind of, you've got the simple, the, the kind of complicated, the chaotic and the co complex. Um, and, and so when the institutions start kind of come to the edge of their ability to respond, then you see this amazing bottom up capacity of normal human beings being like, oh, my gosh, let's set up a WhatsApp group to make sure that our street can do the groceries for like Mrs. Norris, who, you know, who's at number 10 and she can't, you know, she, she's not able to go out shopping for herself. How are we going to together patch that up? Because the institutions aren't they're not coming to save us. They're not actually able to, um, to provide what we need. And so when people become unleashed from, you know, this kind of deadening, pa being a passive player within an institutional system where you've got a role, the role is telling you what, you, what is your job and what is not your job. Um, you know, if you're the head of care, great, you can deliver care. But if you're the head of finance, it's not your role to deliver care. It's not your role to to, you know, to kind of imagine, to kind of do whatever's needed in that responsive moment. So I think there's something interesting there in that human beings, like I have a deep trust of human beings' capacity to love, to care, to, to help each other. You know, even when you look at um, kind of statistics of, you know, what, what a normal percentage of like actual dark triad personality traits are, it's under 10%, you know, nar narcissistic behaviors or Machiavellian um, behaviors, like the vast majority of human beings are wired for care, for collaboration, for, um, you know, for doing whatever's right, whatever's needed, helping, you know, we, as we're social creatures, we get so much of our sense of kind of validation from helping others. And, you know, there's so much interesting research coming out around like pro-social behaviors and, um, you know, humankind and um, Rutger, um, Bregman's work as well. You know, there's so much research that shows that the idea of human beings being um, competitive by nature and uh, operating through survival of the fittest is just a myth. And it's a myth that is backed up basically colonial capitalism. And it's, you know, it's, it's a very well, very consciously chosen myth where 
economists can say, you know, the economic system mimics how life works. The biologists say, you know, life works like this. Um, this, this is the way it is. And then we've got this whole kind of mega structure that um, justifies itself. But what we see is actually that's not true. And human beings can operate in these ways that are deeply loving, collaborative, imaginative. Um, and our big challenge, I think, right now is that we've created an entire megastructure of institutions and um, ways of, of working and policies and frameworks and regulations that actually stop us from being just responding to the alive sense of what is needed and what we should do. And that's that alive sense of what's needed, what we should do, what's possible. Um, that is what I... I really, that, that's what moral imagination um, gestures at. It's that capacity. Um, but without changing the systems, we will be unleashing that capacity and people will be knocking up against those systems. So my work like, really is dependent on all the other people's work in the ecosystem who are helping change all systems because you can't have more moral imagination without a complete rewiring of institutions. And that, like, that's also. I mean, that's also some of the work that we're doing um, too, but obviously not, you know, it's a huge, it's a huge uh, task, but like, it's not enough to train people and to build that capacity of moral imagination. We actually have to rephrase, we have to rewire systems to actually um, better represent and better, better mirror um, how human beings actually work and non-human, you know, that's not even talking about the broader ecology that has been completely left out of our institutional design. So where are non-human beings represented in our governance, in our organizations, in our institutional frameworks? They're not. And so that's part of the work that we're doing is bringing in the more than human, bringing in ancestors and bringing in future generations into how we make decisions, how institutions work, but also in the capacity of people to imagine. Thank you so much for that. I, I think it's so important to constantly highlight the ecosystem, the ecology that we exist in. Yeah. Um, and it's it's very uh, humble and uh, accurate to 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 highlight the fact that, you know, moral imaginations exist within that framework as well of other people doing that work all the time. Yeah. Um, I'm always very uh, <laughs> suspicious is probably too uh, weak a word. I'm also very pissed off <laughs> whenever somebody says that they've got it figured out um, or that there's this one thing that we need to do. Yeah. Um, despite the journalist and me always wanting a nice headline, it's just it's so antithetical to the systems change that, that we face yeah. and the complexities of the problem we face. So thank you very much for that. Um, I would love for you to spend the rest of the time uh, explaining what you've just done with Camden Council, which has been such an amazing feat and credit to them as well for being I don't know, open and willing uh, to invite more larger imaginations through the door and implement your framework through the entire ecosystem, it seems. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it, it has been such a deep honor to work with Camden. Um, yeah, they are an incredible organization. Um, you know, their, their leadership has been incredibly inspiring to me. Like, you know, some of, some of what I've been talking about has been, has been, really inspired by some of the way, you know, some of the, the things I've learned through the work with Camden, through, um, you know, spe spending time with their leaders, Jenny, who's the CEO, and Georgia, who's the um, counselor and leader of Camden. They've been, they've had a huge influence on me. Um, so what we've been doing with Camden has been um, to build a deep demonstrator or an incubator within Camden, within the council, but um, rippling out into the borough um, in the second phase of the work to build imagination capacity and to build moral imagination in the borough of Camden. Um, and, and so we've just come to the end of the first phase and we're about to launch um, a report about the insights and the learning from that first phase. And I, I feel like the most difficult thing has been trying to boil down the like hundreds of pages of notes that you know I've been taking during this project, um, the, the interviews from the participants, the you know, the participants' visions of the future, like there's just this enormous amount of learning and insight that we have been um, gathering and, and putting together. And so this report is like a boiled down distillation of, of just so much learning and, um, and so many stories and, and kind of, yeah, so many people's voices and so many people's work. Like it's been a, a really 
it's been a collaborative effort and it's been a lot of work from a lot of people. So just to start by saying a huge thank you to anyone listening who's been involved, um, but not least to Camden for, yeah, for this partnership. And um, it feels like we're just getting going, even though we've already done so much. So it, yeah, it feels really, really exciting. Um, so what we've done so far is train 32 council officers within Camden with the tools and practices and skills of what we call imagination activism. Um, or, but you could also say moral imagination. Um, and that includes collective imagination. It also includes the framework that I mentioned um, of ancestors, more than human world and future generations. So that's what we call our moral imagining framework because we, I mean, again, we're constantly learning and updating. Um, but over the last three years, as we've developed this work, those, that, those three pillars have become the center of the, the kind of central um, part of how we deliver the organizational work and how we also deliver the, the capacity building, the imagination capacity building. Um, so we, we last end of last year, we ran an eight week imagination activism training for 32 council officers. They were council officers from repairs to planning to, um, early childcare to, you know, to HR. It was a really diverse mix across the whole organization. I mean, even just that on its own, getting a mix of people from such different parts of the organization talking together. You had like the head of housing, you know, how someone from housing transformation next to the person that, you know, that's in charge of green spaces. Like there was this incredible um, energy that was unleashed as people from the council imagined together um, in these, in these undesiloed ways, you know, because usually again, it's like that institutional issue of the siloed teams, housing deals with housing, green spaces deals with green spaces, repairs deals with repairs. But what do you do when the person who's working in early childhood care is, is caring for a family? The, the reason the family is suffering and struggling is because of the quality of housing. The reason the quality of housing is an issue is because there's no green space. Like that, you know, the need for green space influences, um, you know, child, child safety. Like these issues, complex issues are just by nature completely interdependent and also inter, inter, inter silo, interdisciplinary. Um, and so part of how, you know, how, how we've designed our model for unleashing imagination capacity is to go across silos. It's to get out of the silos. It's to bring people together to unleash that capacity for collective moral imagination to to dream how things could be and should be and then work out what we do about it um and it's been you know it's been a, an amazing eight weeks at the end of the eight weeks everybody envisioned you know envisioned a future of camden council that like a council that could actually um uh, they envisioned the future of the council where imagination and moral imagination really you know was unleashed they designed um different interventions, um, like organizational interventions, different things, how they're going to take this work back into their specific area of work. Um, you know, we had people dreaming and designing imagination offices, um, bringing imagination into the hiring process. Um, there's a, there's a group that is really interested in the question of why, what if we hosted the homeless within the Camden council building? What, what's stopping us actually you know, what, what, what would be needed to get to that point? Again, it might be that it doesn't make sense, that there's too much red tape, it's not the right solution, but just that kind of thinking where you start asking these questions, just like in the pandemic where we housed all the homeless. It's like, but what if, what if homelessness was eradicated in Camden? How would we do that? Like that, those are the interesting questions. And the problem is, is we get stuck into just plasticicking the solutions, it's just like reacting, like here's a homeless person. How do we deal with them? How do we make sure that they are housed? But we're not asking that systemic level question of actually how do we get to the place where homelessness is just like not a possibility, doesn't happen because that it just becomes impossible. So the kinds of things that right now seem impossible, like what we'd like to get to is a future where the problems of today seem impossible. That's the kind of flip. Um, and so the program um, was a mix of kind of theory, practice, um, giving people practical tools to take back into their work meetings, into their projects. Um, and, and it was really, you know, what's been wonderful is I think a huge part of this first 
ever, you know, for us, this is our first prototype. This is the first time we've, we've like done, um, this, this scale of the, like applied the work at this scale. Um, and a huge amount of the work has been understanding what is it that stops, uh, institutions and councils and, um, what it, what is it that kind of stops people from wanting to, to build imagination capacity and what is that what's that understanding gap between what we think of as imagination and actually what imagination is so so much of this first project has been um understanding and working really deeply together with camden um to develop the ways that we can explain the power of this work in ways that that are institutionally recognized and and um yeah, that speaks the right, the right language. And also to give people the, you know, the, the confidence that it, that this is going to deliver something that is practical, that does have, um, practical outcome because understandably ca- local councils have extremely limited budgets and resources, you know, especially right now, there's been a huge amount stripped from, from local councils. So to justify spending any council money on a program or on a project of work that has imagination at the core, is really radical um, and and needs to be grounded in the real life changes and the real life benefits and value that is unlocked from a program like this. So a lot of yeah, a, a lot of our work this first time was also really measuring very rigorously what happened, you know, what what did people find useful, and we did you know we were really excited to find that a hundred percent of participants reported that they felt they'd been equipped with practical tools to take back into their work. Um, so if for anyone who's hearing the word imagination and thinking this is something abstract and fluffy and, um, you know, something that doesn't actually have practical, rigorous, strategic value, um, that's, that's what this work has been about is to prove that actually it does. And this is, here's the evidence. Um, and here is also how others can go and do it. Wonderful. I would, I mean, if we had, um, if we had a whole day, (laughs) there would loads of like, go through all of the all of the framework and all of the tools and understand more um how you exactly are implementing this but because we don't have a lot of time if you have any more examples off the top of your head of from these imagination um exercises people coming up with really interesting solutions like housing the homeless in the in council building do you have any more like that um as in some of the other visions that came out of yeah the, yeah um yes let me just have a think so um, we had, we had a really interesting vision around, um, a future of Camden where all employees had well-being passports. So they had a kind of passport when they arrived at the organization where they could design a way of working that put their well-being at the core and that, that this passport would have a structure for checking in with managers, um, to keep on kind of tweaking and iterating um, a way of working that that has well being at the core. We also talked about the four day work week, um, and another really interesting a group. There was a, a small, you know, they were in the group. Uh, participants were in small groups. One of the small groups came up with a whole set of propositions around how Camden, as a four thousand person organization, could could um, incentivize and create the infrastructure for more mixing across teams, across um, these silos, because they really saw how powerful that was within the program. So things like also what, you know, that somebody asked, what if council officers, rather than having roles, were just put on projects, like rather than having a role and being stuck in something, it was this kind of complex system where people could be working on projects with their different expertises, coming together for a project, disbanding again, um, so we talked about those kinds of models too. Um, and just, I, I also just wanted to make a, a, a bit of space to talk about the amazing work that has been happening in Camden before, you know, pre, pre this program too. So there's amazing organizations. One of my favorite um, examples that, that's in the report of imagination activism in, in action is a gr- brilliant project by the local um, social enterprise Think and Do, which was set up um, actually around the question what if we said yes to everything? So there was this question of, of like, what would happen if we said yes, especially around the climate, um, you know, climate crisis. And so this is a resident led um, project and organization. And they have a really, really interesting initiative called the Communities Project, 
where basically tree planting in Camden used to cost um, seven hundred pounds a tree. Working with oh, me. Yeah. working with a company that comes in from you know from outside of Camden, you know that cost covers the the watering, the maintenance, the you know all of the work that goes into making sure that the tree actually survives beyond planting. And what Think and Do has done is set up a program where they've they've been training local young people to become foresters. So you've got this group of like Camden foresters. I met one of the young men, a 19 year old um, amazing man who um, is one of their, you know, one of their first trained foresters. And he was telling me about how amazing this project is and about how he thinks like all, all young people in Camden should have access to this to become foresters, that it's taught him about, um, you know, the power of nature. It's taught him about the, you know, the importance of green space. It's, it's given him also livelihood. It's, you know, it's a big part of his life now. Um, and so they designed this model where they train the local Camden people, young people to become foresters. And, um, you know, they live in Camden and they actually develop a relationship with the trees and help over six months watering the trees, keeping them, you know, ne- giving them what they need. And that brought the price of the tree, you know, per tree down to 200 pounds. So it's like super interesting how this kind of imaginative thinking with the question, not you know, rather than ask like, oh, how can we plant more trees? You know, what they did was look at that that model of doing it that way and and ask, well, what if, you know, what if local people did this? Like, what if we did this ourselves? It's that it's that capacity again to kind of do things differently based on what makes most sense, what's needed, um, and then trying to design from that place. So I just wanted to bring that example in because it it's a, a really great example of imagination activism in action from before. Um, yeah, the program started as well. God, it's so beautiful, isn't it? Once you start to um, imagine what life could be like without capitalism, which dictates that everybody exists in their little atomized silo and can only interact with one another mm-hmm. through you know, financial tra- transactions, essentially, that we only represent to one another financial value. When you start to strip away those layers, which reveals the interconnectedness that is already there, it is already there, just waiting yeah. to be celebrated, waiting to be used. And the projects, the communities, the, the, the love and compassion and well-being that we can build just from recognizing, just from seeing what is already there yeah. is what makes this work as well feel so possible. Exactly as you said, like we, ha- we have the tech. We, have, we even have the political organization, like the, the models, the frameworks, participatory budgeting, uh, liberative democracy all of this stuff we're ready to press go and people are already willing and connected with one another in order to do so okay so it's time to press go yeah (laughs) completely (laughs) agree we agree and i hope that um you know i hope imagination activism can help as a as a complement to traditional activism and like the power of you know that the traditional activism that fights the old systems and structures um you know what what we hope is that imagination activism can be that positive driving collective force that helps people band together and, and do what is possible and also what should, should be possible um, together. And Phoebe, actually, before I let you go, um, you mentioned that this was phase one of the project. Tell us about phase two. So phase two, um, which kicks off you know, at, at this launch of the report, we're kind of marking the, the entry into this, the phase two of the project. So Phase two is about embedding imagination activism across the council. So, you know, we've trained this 32, this cohort of activators. They're going out. Um, they've each run sessions with 10 people. So we've reached 300 of a 3000 ish, um, size organization. But now it's about embedding imagination activism into the policies and frameworks of Camden. Um, which means creating infra- the kinds of infrastructures we talked about that could unleash imagination capacity. It also means working with our framework, the more than human world, future generations and nature, understanding how that can be imba- embedded into teams in Camden and, um, and the governance frameworks of the organization. But it also means rippling out to working with the community and with residents and with elected members um, within neighborhoods. So it's, if you think of it as a kind of concentric circle, we started with the middle of the circle working with um, the 32 imagination activists. We're then rippling out to work with the organization. We've already started training the leadership, which kicked off in April. Um, and then we're rippling out into the borough um, to working with the residents. And you know, the, the invitation to anybody listening, if you're Camden-based and you'd like to be involved, 
please get in touch um, on our website, which I think will probably be in the in the notes of this. But also, if you're not Camden based, if you if you're interested in partnering with us, if you're interested in learning along with us, if you you're, if you've got things that you think we could learn from you, um, we're looking for partners for that second phase. So please do get in touch. Excellent. And can those partners be international? Because Planet Critical, just just to boast here for a second, because I found this out the other day, Planet Critical has subscribers from over 125 countries. Oh, amazing. So, yeah, I read just. <laughs> so incredible. yes, thank you. Uh, yes, if, yeah, well done. Uh, if, uh, yes, sure. Pro- we're, we're looking for UK-based partners right now, um, but we have also started to get interest and, and um, explore collaboration with, yeah, with people across the world. So um, don't hold back if you're not in the UK, but especially if you're in, in the UK, um, do get in touch. Excellent. I'm sure, I hope, and I'm sure that you will get um, lots of people contacting you. I don't think, if any, the planet critical community, from what I understand and see and hear from them, they do not hold back. <laughs> so I hope that they come through. My final question for you is, who would you like to platform? I'd love to introduce you to the the brilliant woman, Debbie, who's behind the Think and Do organization I just mentioned, who works on communities just to bring in um, that, yeah, the Camden perspective from from the residents. Um, but also, yeah, I can, I can, I mean, I, there's a long list of people. There's um, a, one of our advisors, I would really suggest, Deza Gaji, an amazing um, 22-year-old climate activist um, who talks about the need for love in politics. Um, who's incredible. Um, who else? Um, I'm now, now I've just got all of our advisors in mind. <laughs> Anthea Lawson, um, who wrote The Entangled Activist and who taught, you know, who's, whose work is all about um, the inner, the kind of inner and outer. Um, and so how in activism, we often end up um, as activists repeating or, or like playing out um, the, dyna- the very dynamics that we're trying to stop and to fight play out again so there's that entangled activist um yeah element of being entangled um I, yeah i mean there's there's many more there's uh, i could give you a long long list but those are those are a couple wonderful phoebe thank you so much this was such a pleasure thank you thank you for having me it's been really good if you want to learn more i've put links to everything in the description box below remember to subscribe to the channel if you're new here and share the episode if you enjoyed it To support the show, subscribe at planetcritical.com where you can read the weekly newsletter inspired by each interview. You can also become a Planet Critical patron. All links are in the description box below. As always, my deepest thanks to that community. Planet Critical wouldn't exist without your support. Thank you everyone for listening and for coming on this journey together.